uh, has an announcement. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's my great pleasure to introduce the section to Senator Joyce Maker. Uh, she's here for a first time, uh, proxying for Senator Langley. Thank you, Terry, and uh, welcome, Senator. <clears throat> and <clears throat> secondly, the seat uh, on this section that the council uh, sends a representative uh, today. Um, <clears throat> at the last meeting, we had a premier fisherman from the state of Maine. Uh, today, we have the uh, committee chair on the council and a premier fisherman from the state of New Hampshire, uh, Peter Kendall, uh, better known as PK. So welcome, PK. Next on the agenda, <clears throat> approval of the agenda. Are there any changes, additions to the agenda? Terry. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Under other business, I'd like to add a short discussion on the RSA program. Okay, we will do that. Thank you, Terry. Next, uh, <clears throat> approval of the proceedings from the February 2017 meeting. Are there any changes or additions to the those proceedings? Seeing none, uh, motion passes. Public comment. Is there any public comment on issues that are not on the agenda? And I think we have a sign-in sheet. Uh, could you raise your hand if you were, oh, Glenn, you can come up to the public mic. Yeah, Glenn Robbins, uh, fishing vessel Western Sea. I'm a SANA, per SANA for Herring out of Maine. And I just want to give you a little update on what I see has been going on in our fishery in the last 20 years uh, since the trawlers came in. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows what's been going on in the population of Herring on Georges, but it's been dwindling rapidly in the last couple of years. Uh, I tried several times to get somebody to listen to, maybe we should have a spawn enclosure to protect these fish and stretch us out a little longer. But all I got was, no, there's plenty of fish out on Georgia's. We don't need it at this time. Well, I think time has elapsed now and we're at crunch time and that there's hardly anything left on Georgia's. The trawler guys will tell you that there's haddock out there too many, but they don't bring them in with the herring. They don't even try. Uh, so we've, we've got a big problem out there. Maybe we should have a monitorium on it, or maybe we should, like many other countries, outlaw ban, ban the trawl altogether. It's not a good way to go. It's too deadly. It, cleans up too much and it doesn't come back fast. Uh, working with the first scene in 1A, we seem to keep our fish pretty good and we always keep, catch our quota. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, Ryan Raber, you pass, okay. Sean, pass, okay, thank you. Okay, next on the agenda is consider addendum one for final approval. Ashton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, could we? Terry? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Real briefly, in my introduction to Senator Maker, I neglected to mention that she is a co-chair of the Marine Resource Committee. So we're here with a, I'm sitting next to an esteemed colleague. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Terry. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to present the public comment summary for draft addendum one to the Interstate Atlantic Herring Fisheries Management Plan. 
as shown on the agenda, um, I'm going to present this in two parts. It's very similar to how I did it at the public hearings. The first part is going to be on the six options within the addendum, followed by the LEC and the advisory panel comment. Um, then we'll close the discussion and then we'll reopen it for the scoping questions on a tiered weekly landing system. And I'll go over the public comment summary for that as well. Uh, brief overview of the addendum timeline. So the section initiated uh, this addendum in, last year in October. This was following the 2015 and 2016 fishery performance. Um, there was a working group meeting in New Hampshire at the beginning of the year to discuss all of the options that would be in the document. Uh, originally there was nine options. As you saw in the document now, it's six. Um, this was the draft addendum as you see it now. Um, with some alterations, was presented at the end of January to this section. It was approved for public comment and then it went out for public comment. I did public hearings um, along the coast and received written comments as well. And now we're here today where we're going to review all the public comment and potentially approve draft addendum one um, to the fisheries manager plan. The provisions of or when, the, when they are going to be implemented still needs to be discussed by this section. Um, as we know, the fishing year starts on June 1st for, the, for Area 1A. So brief uh, background about the statement of the problem. So in recent years, the Area 1A trimester 2 fishery, which is June through September, has harvested herring at a rate that if left unrestricted would exceed the seasonal quota in weeks, not months. Um, so there's been an increase in fishing effort and vessel capacity combined with a decrease of readily available herring in Area 3. Traditionally, Area 1A and Area 3 taken together in the summer months um, largely support the, the lobster bait market. Um, so if one area is not providing enough herring, then there's going to be automatically be a shortage. So attempts to spread the area to, to spread the trimester to quota have proven to be ineffective. So as we saw last year, Maine um, implemented measures that were more restrictive than those of the commission to kind of um, curtail effort. So the purpose of this addendum is to develop additional management measures to ensure the seasonal quotas spread out through the entirety of trimester two are consistent between the states and address any excessive capacity in this fishery. A lot of the measures are geared towards the, the days out program. An overview of the public comment summary. So I uh, went and presented this, uh, the presentation uh, in Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and New Jersey. I also received written comment um, from 18 different entities that are listed on the board as well. I should note that there was some um, main participants that were at the New Hampshire and the Massachusetts hearings. So you'll see, um, so you just should note that for whenever you look at the public comment summary as to where the votes were. Um, some the people wanted me to note that. So for consideration, there are six options, um, as you can see here right now, that are under consideration. I should note that the PDT said that uh, to improve the stability of the fishery and stabilize the rate of harvest during the fishing season, the adoption of all six is not necessary. So one or two could be adopted, all six could be adopted. Um, it's up to the section at this meeting. The first option is the state vessel landing reports. So option A is, uh, is status quo, meaning that the majority of the vessels in this fishery are federal vessels. They submit federal VTRs and they would continue doing so. Option B says uh, that the vessels in this fishery would also submit state landing reports. These landing reports would give the commission and the states access to real-time data um, that they did not previously had, uh, that they didn't previously have. Usually we went to the um, GARFO's uh, weekly monitoring reports for kind of just an update on where fishing, or the rate of catch that was happening in this fishery. But weekly is not enough for some of the, weekly access to data is not enough for some of the options in here, such as a weekly landing limit. We would need access to, to more real-time data. Uh, I should note that the Commission did send a letter to NIMPS requesting access to daily catch data for select state staff. Um, and thankfully, or happily, uh, NIMPS has approved the Commission's request. So there was three individuals, one from Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts, that were included in that letter um, to garner access to this data. And uh, NIMPS is actively working with those individuals to, to, to get access. So the section could opt to just um, not implement um, option B, they could just go with status quo, knowing that now these three state staff have access um, to the data that we have requested and that they need in order to, to implement something like a weekly landing report, a weekly landing limit. But I do want to present the, the public comment summary on this issue. Um, just for the table, you'll see that the columns are uh, Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and then WC is written comment. Okay, so as you can see, the majority of people, well, the, 
they were interesting. So there's some caveats. So some that were in favor of option B implementing a, st implementing a state landing report said they would do so reluctantly. They wanted the commission to have access to the data they needed to manage the fishery. However, submitting a du uh, duplicate report was of course seen as a burden on them and something that they didn't want to do. So they really wanted the commission to work with the National Marine Fishery Service to get access to this data, um, which, which happened. So issue two is to modify the days out program. So option A, status quo, um, right now harvesters are prohibited from landing herring on a day out of the fishery. So if there's seven days in the fishery um, and the managers come together and say that you know, Monday and Tuesday are available for fishing, then a vessel can land on Monday and Tuesday only. There's nothing to say that you know, they, can't they can't still fish or they can't um, be in possession of fish during a, day out, a day's out. Option B and C specifically state that. It says that harvesters are prohibited from landing or possessing herring caught from Area 1A during a day out of the fishery. So option B applies this as a blanket statement to all harvesters, whereas option C implements this only for Category A vessels, which make up the majority of landings in this fishery. When looking at the public comment on this, uh, the majority were in favor of status quo, meaning no restriction on landing if fish were caught during a day out. Those opposed to options B and C voiced concerns about weather, safety, and economic constraints if the measures were implemented. Option B and C were also voiced as being inconsistent with the federal plan. At some of the public hearings, there was a request for the Days Out program to be reevaluated re in terms of whether it was necessary if a weekly landing limit was implemented. If there was a weekly landing limit, then there was a preference for the available landing days to be set at seven days. So issue three is the weekly landing limit. So this would be a limit, um, just a blanket limit for all vessels in the fishery and it would be um, for each vessel. So option A, status quo, there is no weekly landing limit um, in this fishery set forth by the commission. We know that Maine implemented one last year, but um, from the commission's point of view and the fisheries management plan, there is no weekly landing limit. So option B and C implement one. Um, option B is only for category A permits. Option C is for category A and C permits. There was also uh, a note in the document that said that vessels must notify uh, states of their intent to fish in Area 1A and the gear type uh, 45 days prior to the start of the fishing season. This was uh, to be used by the technical committee to, de to determine the initial weekly landing limit. So we would need to know this is the, the trimester two um, quota, this is the amount of vessels that are in the fishery, this is the amount of weeks that we want to be harvesting, and that would the simple math would then determine the weekly landing limit but the TC would in some way need to know, they would need to have some number of the vessels that would be in that fishery. The public comment summary on this issue um, was, option, was in favor of option C, um, which would apply the weekly lane limit to categories A and C vessels. Over and over again, I heard the terms, you know, just equal restrictions was, equal restrictions for all vessels in the fishery was a preferred management approach. There was some support for option B because sea vessels, um, there's some support for option B because sea vessels already have a landing limit of 25 metric tons. So as the federal permit holders, they're limited to 25 metric tons. Um, these vessels noted that the majority of sea vessels can't hold anywhere near 25 metric ton capacity. And it's very unlikely that these vessels would even fish at seven days per week at that capacity. For those reasons, um, they felt that applying these measures that these measures should only be applied to Category A vessels and applying them to Category C vessels was just another burden on them as well that wasn't even necessary. Two questions came up on, on this topic um, uh, frequently. One was, can a vessel leave Area 1A if it's declared into the fishery? The answer is yes. This is just a requirement to declare into the fishery. There is no actual requirement to fish in Area 1A as your sole management area where you fish. A vessel could come into Area 1A, leave and go to Area 3, come back to Area 1A. It, that would, of course, change um, the math, which goes to the second question, is, is the weekly lane limit fixed over time? And no, it's not. So if a, ves a vessel leaves to go into Area 3, then we, uh, TC would have to adjust the weekly lane limit um, over time to make sure that the trimester 2 uh, quota is being fully utilized. There is no concern that the quota wouldn't be utilized because it has always been in, in previous years. I mean, we're just talking about sta uh, stabilizing the rate of catch. There's no reason to believe that, that a weekly land limit would diminish um, any kind of catch or, or limit catch in any way. So issue four is uh, landing restrictions on transfers at sea. 
Option A is uh, status quo. A vessel with proper permits can transfer or receive Atlantic herring at sea. Uh, option B is herring caught in area 1A can only be landed by the respective harvester vessel, which um, frankly just means there, there would be no carrier vessels. The vessel that caught the fish would then land the fish. There would be no transfers at sea. Option C is herring carrier vessels are limited to receiving at sea transfers from one harvester vessel per week, and there can be one landing per 24 hour period. Maine did implement this in, in 2016. Um, there is some PDT concerns, or not concerns, but just to note for the PDT that the states that didn't implement this, so New Hampshire, Massachusetts, would have to develop some kind of reporting mechanism to, to somehow monitor any kind of transfers at sea. I mean, this is, the carrier vessels don't have to report on um, federal VTRs anymore, only the harvester vessels do, so it needs to be some way that the states can, can monitor if these vessels are actually transferring at sea and if they're actually landing once per day, and that would still need to be developed. So when looking at the public comment summary, there was support for option C if it could reduce fishing pressure. Although some didn't support it because it could put uh, smaller carriers out of, business, out, of, out of business, similar to what option B is explicitly doing. So, if a harvester, so for example, if a harvester vessel can only choose one carrier vessel per week, the size of the vessel will likely be an important factor and a bigger carrier vessel that can hold more fish would be more attractive to the harvester vessels, thereby putting the smaller vessels out of business if they can only choose one carrier vessel per week. Um, there was also a fair amount of concern that limiting carriers could increase slippage. If a harvester can only transfer to one carrier vessel and they have uh, more than what they, their vessel can hold, more than what the carrier can hold, then the additional fish would have to be dumped. Concern that dumping a fish goes against the goals and objectives of the state FMP, which is voiced by participants, and it would also um, be inconsistent, the state and the federal FMP would also be inconsistent on this matter. For the small mesh bottom trawl days out, uh, option, d option A is status quo. So right now the days out program is, applies to all harvesters regardless of gear type. Option B is a small mesh bottom trawl days out program for category C and D permits that opt into the program. There would also be a notification period of 45 days prior to the start of the fishing season. Um, I just want to touch on why this was initiated. <coughs> so small mesh bottom trawl vessels um, have traditionally been um, targeting whiting and they would like to target whiting at, in the, during the week, so like Monday through Friday. The landing days program has always, and so then they would probably, and then they want to target herring over the weekend. But the landing days program has always about, allowed landing days at the beginning of the week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is when you can land herring. But these small mesh bottom trawl vessels are landing whiting at that time. And so then whenever they want to land herring would be on the weekend, those days are generally closed to fishing because that's not when they've ever, it's never been available, um, there's never been available, there's hardly, rarely ever available landing days on the weekends. So this was um, initiated to kind of apply, apply more flexibility for those fishing vessels, for the small mesh bottom trawl fishing vessels in this fishery. Okay, so for uh, the public comment summary, you can see that most people were in favor of option B. Uh, there was actually a petition that was um, given to me at uh, the New Hampshire and Massachusetts public hearings and I'll just paraphrase, and, and I paraphrase it and I'll read it right now. So it says, we, the Massachusetts, New Hampshire fishermen and lobstermen are very concerned with the unavailabil unavailability of herring to our area of Southern Area 1A during July through September. There's a small but important traditional whiting fishery that takes place in our area from July through October that can only catches 1% of the sub-ACL. Due to the more restrictive landing days being proposed, we support option B. There's also some comments that said that, you know, the lobstermen do rely on um, herring bait from the Swamish bottom trawl vessels and that, you know, last year and the year before when there's a shortage of herring, it's harder for, and a lot of the herring is landed in Maine, it's harder for that, that bait to kind of come down into the New Hampshire and Massachusetts area. So they were having less and less bait, and so they would like to have measures that allow these Swamish bottom trawl vessels to land the herring so that they can have more access to bait. Um, given a good number of the small mesh bottom trawl vessels do not start fishing until mid-July, there was also preference to shorten the declaration period or abolish it in general. So for example, it could start on you know, June 1st um, instead of 45 days out since they usually don't start fishing until mid-July. The last issue was a clarification of the days out program. So currently the FMP states that if, um, says that if states cannot come to a days out decision, then the matter will come before the section at the next scheduled meeting. 
Um, so it does, but it doesn't say like how the states would agree. Um, and so this kind of clarifies um, how they would agree. So it can be option B1, voting, B2, consensus. And what is the default landing days if the states cannot come to an agreement? Um, is it seven available landing days, um, which is option C? It also has a note in here that if, if at, some, at some point in the season that the states did previously agree, so let's say on June 1st they agree to three landing days, and then July 1st they want to change it to two landing days, if they can't come to an agreement, then the three landing days would just carry over. Since they didn't come to an agreement, that would just roll over. Option C2 says that if they can't come to an agreement, then zero landing days um, would be implemented until an agreement is reached. So the public comment summary on this was a little bit mixed. Um, so there was a fair number of people that were in favor of option B1 as voting, as just the fairest way to make a decision. Each state should have to just make a vote and we'll see, we'll see where it lands. Since there's only three states, clearly there's, there's gonna be a decision made. Um, those in favor of option B2, a consensus, said that this could force the parties to talk it out, you know, let, and make sure that everyone stated their opinion on the matter and kind of talk through why the number of days might be better or um, worse than others. And they, um, people also said they didn't want voting to, res or they, didn't want, they thought that voting might result in one state just constantly being overpowered by the other two. Um, there was a number of people in favor of option C1, so that would roll over the existing um, days out, uh, landing days, or implement seven days. Um, there were some people that were in favor of option C2, which is zero days, um, mainly saying that this could force a decision. Clearly, no one wants to have zero landing days available in this fishery that would effectively, effectively shut it down. Um, some people also opposed C2 because it could shut down the, this fishery. And since it is a federal fishery, they didn't think that, the, um, that it should be just shut down just because three states couldn't come to an agreement. So with that, I'll take questions. Thank you, Ashton. That's <clears throat> making a complicated uh, report fairly simple. Any questions for Ashton? Okay, seeing none, uh, I'll go to the advisory panel report. Jeff? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the section, uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Jeff Kalin with Lunds Fisheries, um, Cape May, New Jersey, and privileged to chair the AP. Um, there is a copy of uh, our brief report in uh, your packet. Uh, we didn't have a quorum, but we proceeded to operate um, by consensus where we could, Mr. Chairman, and uh, that's reflected in the discussion. And also, as you know, on the agenda later today, there's an opportunity to refresh, begin the process of refreshing the AP. Um, so we met by conference call on April 10th. We um, dis discuss the uh, management alternatives that you just uh, uh, heard reviewed by Ashton and uh, um, also the uh, comments from the various public hearings. And so uh, relative to management alternatives on the first issue, state vessel landing reports, um, the discussion focused on the applicability of VMS as an avenue for the states to monitor the rate of catch. That's on the agenda for later um, for, for your consideration. I think, I think the feeling was that since um, the fleet was uh, making pre-trip landing reports daily, that uh, if the commission had that information, um, uh, you'd have a better idea where you are. Uh, relative to the 1A quota um, in more of a real-time sense. Uh, one member noted, however, they would reluctantly comply with the additional reporting requirements if, if option B were to be implemented. Um, and uh, one member commented that boats with federal permits are already reporting. I just made that point and don't want to report uh, the same information twice. So that discussion will occur later uh, in your agenda. On issue two, um, prohibit landings of herring caught in 1A during a day out of the fishery. Three members were in favor of option A, the status quo. Uh, there was opposition to restricting the possession of herring on a day out because the majority of fishing takes place in federal waters. Two of the three members believe the days out should be a tool for managers if needed, but if a weekly landing limit is implemented, then harvesters should be allowed to land seven days per week. On the weekly landing limit, 
the AP supported using a weekly landing limit, but was opposed to the requirement that harvesters declare into the fishery 45 days prior to the start of the fishing season. Um, there was no preferred declaration period offered, and the AP was questioning the purpose of this lengthy declaration uh, for f the following reasons. It uh, doesn't restrict vessels to fishing in 1A. It's easy to know the number of vessels fishing per week because the Area 1A fishery is small. Not a good indicator of future effort, of future effort, as it was anticipated that all vessels would simply declare into the fishery. The weekly landing limit will fluctuate based on the number of vessels fishing each week in any case. Uh, issue 4, landing restriction on transfers at sea. There was support for status quo, option A, because the other options could lead to discards. And the members on the call think a weekly landing limit is sufficient effort, a sufficient effort control and restrictions on carriers aren't necessary. Uh, there was one advisor that asked if option C would put smaller carriers out of business. Others commented that it likely would because the preference would shift to larger carriers. On uh, one member of voice, they didn't want harvesters with the additional capacity of carriers targeting and taking entire schools of herring. Other members voiced that it's not the goal of the harvester to take the entire school, but if there is extra fish that are caught, they should be transferred to a carrier rather than being dumped. Any option that has a chance of increasing discard should be avoided. I think that was a consensus statement. On the small mesh bottom trawl days out, members supported option B as long as the vessels were required to report their landings. Uh, for example, if a state vessel, if state vessel landing reports are implemented, then they should be required for the small mesh bottom trawl fleet as well. On the clarification of the days out procedure, two members preferred option B2, the consensus option, because it required managers to discuss the issues in detail. Some members questioned option C2, zero days, because it has the potential to shut down a federal fishery, whereas two members viewed it as an incentive for managers to come to an agreement and force a consensus. So we didn't have consensus on that. So, uh, Section 4, scoping questions. Uh, there were two members of the AP opposed to tiered weekly landing limits because it's not consistent with a federal FMP. Um, if this effort was to be considered, it should be initiated by the council. And, we all know that there's a letter from the council to the section um, on, on those issues. So that ends my report, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, are there any questions for Jeff? Okay, seeing none, <clears throat> thank you again. Um, law enforcement, Lieutenant. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Lieutenant Michael Eastman, uh, the Chairman of the Law Enforcement Committee and also Law Enforcement Advisor uh, to the Herring Board. A uh, reference to Addendum 1, on uh, March 17, 2017, uh, the Law Enforcement Committee had a teleconference call in which we discussed Addendum 1. Um, in attendance of that uh, teleconference on this matter was North Carolina, Rhode Island, Florida, Maine, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, New York. Virginia, Maryland, Georgia, New Jersey, Delaware, the U.S. Coast Guard, and NOAA OLE. Uh, reference to issue one, uh, harvester report requirements, uh, we, the LEC, uh, recommended the most timely and accurate reporting possible to enhance enforcement efforts. Uh, state access to federal reports uh, is important for timeliness. Maine reported success in implementing state reports and was able to regularly review email reports for carrier vessels. Issue two, uh, days out, the LEC did not offer any comments or recommendations on options in this draft. Issue three, weekly landing limits. Uh, we recommended establishing weekly landing limits in pounds and truckloads. Maine reported no significant problems in implementing a weekly landing limit. Their officers typically monitored landings by truckloads truck rather than by poundage, a more efficient process. They used an est estimate of approximately 40,000 pounds per truckload. With timely access to reports, weekly landing limits can be enforced. Issue four, restrictions on transfers at sea. Uh, the LEC believes that option B is more 
forcible than option C, but recognizes this may place a hardship on carrier vessels that have operated for many years. Issue five, days out for small mesh bottom trawl vessels. We are comfortable with adoption of option B and did not believe an additional program for small mesh bottom trawl vessels would be overly confusing. Uh, would be overly confusing for an enforcement pers from an enforcement perspective. Pardon me. Issue six: clarification on days out procedure. Uh, the LEC did not have any comments regarding this issue. The LEC appreciates the opportunity to provide enforcement advice to the Atlantic Herring Management Section regarding Draft Addendum One. That is all I have, Mr. Chairman. Are there any questions? Thank you, Mike. Any questions for Lieutenant Eastman? Okay, seeing none, uh, I know you have a letter uh, from the council, but I'd like to recognize uh, PK to see if he has any additions to that. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. I'd like to uh, thank the commission for allowing the New England Council to have a seat and uh, thank the commission for allowing the council to uh, comment after the, after the deadline. Uh, the council met as a whole after the deadline, and we were able to um, comment after the deadline, so we appreciate that. Um, our executive director summed up any concerns the council has in a letter to the commission. Uh, should be in your correspondence. Um, and I'll just go through a, briefly uh, a couple of bullet points, um, what the council thought. So under the harvesting reports, um, the council uh, was not clear about uh, the sharing requests that the commission made to GARFO, and uh, confidential uh, data needs to be carefully considered when, when asking about that because there's so few vessels in the fleet. Uh, as far as uh, <coughs> prohibiting landings um, for herring caught in area days one using the days out, um, both option B and C have the potential to affect herring fishing activity by federal herring permit holders. The federal FMP does not limit fishing activity using the days out. Therefore, this might be inconsistent with the uh, federal FMP. So the council had a little concern about that. Um, as far as the weekly, weekly landing limit uh, per vessel, the council just had concern that, um, you know, this might increase uh, slippage and discards using the, the weekly uh, landing limits. Uh, as far as landing restrictions on transfers at sea, the council was still unclear whether or not um, the commission would be able to uh, restrict uh, carrier vessels at all. Um, the small mesh bottom trawl, again, is reported uh, by Ashton and I think Jeff as well, the 45-day um, uh, comment period um, is, is probably too long, especially if the addendum one doesn't go into effect until June. It could affect the uh, opening of the herring industry in, in July. So um, with that, as far as uh, clarification, um, Clarification on the days out procedure. The council doesn't have any concerns other than um, it supports defining the uh, procedure a little bit better, which I think you'll end up doing. Thank you, PK. Any questions for PK? Okay, seeing none, <clears throat> it's time to consider final action. Uh, oh, sorry, Dr. Pierce. Well, not a question of PK, but I, I've got a comment regarding the letter, if I may. Uh, PK did a good job summarizing the New England Council's perspective, but uh, it's, it's obvious that there are other New England Council members present here as voting members of the Sea Hearing Section, and that would be myself and Terry and, uh, and um, Northwest New Hampshire and uh, Rhode Island and Connecticut. So. Uh, we're all part of, uh, of the New England Council as well. We wear a few hats. So I'm very sympathetic, of course, to the points that were made by, uh, by the Council uh, specific to this uh, proposed uh, addendum. Uh, but I feel it's necessary to at least make a couple of points regarding a few of the comments made that 
Uh, this proposed addendum may substantially and adversely affect the Federal Atlantic Herring Fishery Management Plan. Very specific language has great meaning, of course, and great significance. And I still say, and I said this at the New England Council meeting when we discussed uh, what would be said to this particular section, uh, that this section has done a lot over the years to help the New England Council achieve the objectives of the Federal Fisheries Management Plan by virtue of the way in which we have uh, controlled, managed, regulated the, the effort of uh, federal permit holders who land in our states. Um, and as a consequence of, a consequence of that, uh, I find it hard to believe that we are in any way substantially and adversely affecting the federal FMP. I'd also highlight that the comments are made uh, and I, I understand why the comments were made, but I have to reflect on other things that states are doing um, and that we've been doing for many, many years. Uh, we see hearing, for example, our spawn enclosures. We affect federal fishing. And we affect the fishing of federal permit holders in federal waters by virtue of our spawn enclosures. They, they, they cannot fish. Uh, I note that some states actually have, in the mid-Atlantic area specifically, they actually have some federal quotas that were allocated to federal permit holders using a state individual transferable quota approach. And the federal government never objected to that. And to me, that's a rather interesting way for states to deal with federal permit holders, some states anyways. And, um, uh, well, I'll stop there. There are many other examples that can be provided regarding how states are attempting to assist the councils uh, better manage the, these fisheries, and that involves impacting the, the efforts of federal uh, permit holders who obviously have permits to land in our various states. So, again, I appreciate the, the issues and the comments made by the council, but I'm very confident uh, that we in no way have uh, um, put the federal plan at risk that we have substantially or adversely affected uh, the federal FMP. Thank you, David. I think that's important clarification, so thank you for that. Um, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, um, <clears throat> we're up for considering final approval for addendum one. Um, unless there's an objection, um, I'm going to take a motion that includes everything in the addendum and try that to see if we can get through this quickly. So, uh, Terry, I'll recognize you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Kirby, I've sent you the motion. Okay, I, I'm going to move that the Herring section approve the following measures for the Herring Addendum 1. And when it gets them up on the board, I'll go through them section by section. Section 3.1.1, the harvester reporting requirements. Option B, implement the state landings reporting as an alternative in the FMP in the event that uh, NIMPS rescinds VMS access to the states. Section 3.1.2, prohibit the landings of herring caught in Area 1A during a day out of the fishery. Option C, days out of restrictions for vessels with a Category A permit. Section 3.1.3, weekly landing limit per vessel pounds. Option B, weekly harvester landing limits for vessels with a Category A permit. In 2017, vessels must opt into Area 1A by the May 23rd days out meeting. Section 3.1.4, landing restrictions on transfers at sea with reporting exemptions to states that have no carrier landings. Options both B and C, the section members from Maine, New Hampshire, and Mass will have a choice of both options at their annual days out meetings. Option B is no herring carrier vessels are transfer at sea, and option C is herring carrier vessels are limited to receiving at sea transfers from one vessel per week and landing once per 24-hour period. Section 3.1.5, small mesh bottom trawl fleet stay out, option B. Additional days out program for small mesh bottom trawl vessels with a category C or D permit. And finally, section 3.1.6, clarification of the days out procedure, options B, uh, type of agreement consensus with coupled with option C2, default landing day scenario would be zero landing days. And I've got a little rationale if I get a second. Is there a second? Uh, Dennis Abbott, second. Uh, go ahead, Terry. 
Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you, Dennis. I mean, it's, it's my belief that these combined alternatives led some new tools to the hearing section uh, members of uh, from Maine, New Hampshire, and Mass for potential implementation in Area 1A this this coming year. These measures were pilot tested by the state of Maine this last year to ensure that an even playing field uh, uh, will happen between the vessels and the different states. This, these measures will ensure that the Area 1A uh, uh, fishery landings will be spread out into September, providing bait for all three states' lobster fisheries. And it, it will allow for the necessary flexibility and accountability for the Category C and small mesh trawlers that have traditionally only harvested about 1% of, the, of the, the overall quota. These, these uh, small mesh tr uh, tr uh, um, trawler provisions will allow for weather market safety issues and uh, the number of days can be modified in mid-season if landings exceed uh, TC's projections. And, and um, in uh, proving both alternatives for the landing restrictions on transfers at sea will allow the uh, section to annually determine the most appropriate option dependent upon the number of vessels opting into the fishery. And finally, we've operated under voting by consensus for a long time. We have a pretty good cooperation between the three states and uh, in my sense is that consensus ensures that continued cooperative management and should consensus not be agreed upon which we have not yet now um, no landings would would rather than a wide open landings from my perspective would further enable uh, some sort of uh, resolution so that's my rationale mr chairman thank you thank you terry um any other input doug Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Terry, for this motion. I do have a couple questions. Uh, one specifically to uh, 3.1.4, uh, where you uh, mentioned that um, we are selecting options B and C. The section will have the choice of both alternative options at the annual days out meeting. Uh, do you mean the section members from Massachusetts, Maine, and New Hampshire? Yeah, th thank you for the question, Doug. Yes, that's correct. It's just those three states that uh, annually determine the, the, uh, the, the days out measures. Would you, would you like to have a, a, a friendly amendment to make that clear, Mr. Chairman? Uh, I'm sure the seconder are okay with that. So the wording would be the section members from Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. Okay, thank you. Um, for that friendly, I have on this particular issue, and I'll wait till. Also, is there any objection to that friendly amendment? Seeing none. So my question is for. Uh, Mr. Stockwell. Sorry, Doug. Sorry, Doug. I didn't hear you. I'm sorry, but yeah, I haven't. I haven't given it. Um, on this, one of the things that I had concerns with this is that um, this would require states to implement a both a a permit system for the um, carrier vessels and a monitoring system for the carrier vessels. And at least one in probably two states don't have carrier vessels um, that uh, are part of our landing in our state. And I am concerned about the, uh, the, uh, the implementing this for something that we don't have. Uh, and so I was a little bit, I understand your desire and, and the need to have something like this, but to have to implement it in a state that doesn't have carrier vessels concerns me, and I, I am concerned about uh, supporting it if I'm going to have to uh, implement that. 
Terry, respond. Yeah, to that point, Doug, would, would it give you comfort if, if it was modified to add permitting and reporting? I mean, there's under 3.1.4, there's a reporting exemption. Do you want to uh, would reporting and permitting exemption to states that have no carry landings work for you? That would. Thank you. Any objections for the seconder of uh, making that change? Dennis? Any objections from the section? Okay. So, so like Kirby, that's section 3.1.4. It would be uh, with exemption states, uh, landing restrictions on tr transfer at sea with a uh, reporting and permitting ex exception to states that have no carrier landings. First line after with. Oh, wait a second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have to ask the question because I'm not uh, totally hang, clear. Hang on a minute. Oh, sorry, sorry. So is the change as you uh, suggested? Yes, I am, and I have one other question. Go ahead, ready? Doug. Um, one of the, 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 I know we had a, uh, uh, under 3.1.3, .3, we have a modified uh, um, period when we have to uh, declare into the fishery. One of the things for the small mesh bottom trawl fleas days out is we needed to have the small mesh bottom trawls declare um, their intent to fish in 1A2 so that we have a, uh, at least according to the uh, addendum, we have a, a list of the small mesh bottom trawls that are fishing. Um, so I'm wondering if we need to have a modified um, 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 declaration date for this year also. Now it's probably not as um, critical right now because those boats, at least in the uh, 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 I believe the fishery doesn't start until January, July 15th, so we may still be in good shape if we pass this amendment now or this addendum now. I just want to make sure that we're, we don't have to have a modified uh, date at this point, whether we'll be okay with not getting that, with requiring that that be in by, it would be probably June 1. And I asked that of the PDT, and then the TC is just going to have to monitor these uh, these vessels. Ashton, I just had a question. Um, just given the public comment that I received, would the section be interested in having the June first date be the date in perpetuity? Um, just given that 45 days from the start of the fishing season of June first really isn't the start of their fishing season. It's it's quite far out for them. Um, so I just wanted to know if that was. Um, up for consideration, or if the TC, Renee, if you had any qualms against that. I'm, uh, I'm okay with it being done at least by that time. I guess no, I'm a little Hang on, Terry. <clears throat> I've had Eric waiting here a bit, so let, let me go to Eric. Uh, back to Terry. I'm a little confused by the question there. Is it the reference to all all access to Area 1A, or just this, just small mesh? Small just mesh. small mesh bottom trawl at June 1st, 
from for every year. That sounds good to me. We have right. to put something in to reflect that. Yeah, I'm, no objections. All small mesh bottom trawls must declare into the fishery by June 1st every year. In the area 1A fishery. Second row, okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, you've repeatedly violated all our training and <laughs> parliamentary <laughs> procedure, but that's fine. I can make a motion. <laughs> I know that. I, I am asking if there's any objection, though. <laughs> Thank you. Eric. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just, it has to be explained to me what the impact is on um, foreign carriers. Uh, there, there's Canadian boats that come down that are carriers, and, and I don't know what their involvement, how many there are, and what the effect this has on them. So if you could, I, I appreciate the motion, but I, I'd like to get some clarification on what that means. Terry. Good question, Eric. Uh, there's a 4,000 ton uh, border transfer uh, that's in place ir irregardless of this. So, so essentially this would have no no ramifications there or on the US fleet and landings in the states. So we're good with that. The, the, the herring goes both ways. All right, thank you. Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe I'm on board with all this. I just need one clarification. I don't know if it's gonna come from Terry or somebody on staff, but the declaration in on May 23rd what does that mean? I mean, I thought when we asked people to declare it so we could plan our days out, but is, is this, I heard a lot of different things said during the readings of all the comments. Does, does declaring in mean nothing more than you might be one of the boats in it and you can come and go at will? Correct. It doesn't bind a boat to do anything. So, so my guess is anybody that has any thought at all about fishing is just gonna declare. David. Terry's done a good job addressing uh, the addendum and the statement of the problem. I appreciate uh, every aspect of the, the motion that has been made except one part of it. Uh, we have a serious problem with how we control the landings of, uh, of sea herring in our different states relative to the quotas that we have to live with. Uh, there's a desperate need to slow this fishery down in order to provide uh, a more steady supply of lobster bait. So I'll support the motion uh, as presented uh, just with one exception, and I would like to uh, move to amend, and that would be to change 3.1.6 option B2 and make that option B1, which would be that the states of Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts will vote on the parameters of the Days Out program. So instead of seeking consensus, I appreciate the, the merits of that, but in this particular case, um, reflecting on the many years of working with uh, the other two states, New Hampshire and Maine, and debating whether we should vote or whether there should be a consensus, uh, I'm, I'm convinced that we should just do it as a formal vote make it uh, far simpler. So that's my, my motion to amend, to, to change it from option B2 to B1. Thank you, David. Is there a second to that motion? You, you seconded that, Dennis? Okay. Discussion? Okay, we ready to vote on the amendment. Ashton. Uh, I just had a quick question for the state landing reports, just so I um, understand for whenever we write up the final document. So this would just to say that if for some reason um, National Marine Fisheries Service 
rescinded the access to the three states that then the state landing reports would go in. The states don't have to develop the criteria or anything to implement such a system that would come at a later date? That's correct. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion on PK? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Not, not necessarily on the uh, motion to amend, but maybe the, the main motion as amended. But um, I have a question on the timing of, uh, of everything. So if this, if you take final action today, I mean, you're expecting everybody to declare in by May 23rd? And then all the small mesh, you know, for this fishing year, and for all the small mesh bottom trawls to declare in by June 1st. Is that correct? That is how the motion has outlined the dates, yes. Okay, my, my concern is just the, the timing of it. That's, that's pretty fast. So as long as uh, everybody gets noticed to, to make sure, especially small mesh bottom trawls who might not be, I mean, the, the you know, the bigger fleet might, most, most of the guys are here or the world will get out pretty fast, but as long as the small mesh bottom trawls know that they have to declare in in the next few weeks here, then I'll be comfortable with it. So the three states, uh, Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts are comfortable that they're going to be able to notify their uh, small mesh bottom trawl fleets. So, yes. he's nodding. Thank you. Uh, Dennis? Would it be permissible, permissible at this time for me to comment on the motion? On the amendment? Yes. On yeah. the, yes. Okay. I seconded this motion for several reasons. One of them being, I'll uh, backtrack and say that I've been involved in this three-state affair and setting our days out for a long time, and in, in many instances, we ended up convincing Dr. Pierce to go along with the other two states, and he's always been pliable in whatever. But the very fact is, is that if you insist on consensus, it really allows the minority a bit more power than they deserve. So I, although we seek ultimately for consensus, if the case situation comes up where we're unable to achieve consensus, I think that it should be majority rule, and that's the reason that I seconded Dr. Pierce's motion. Thank you, Dennis. Terry? That's too good an opportunity to let go. Um, I feel quite opposite. I feel that as a state with 95 plus percent of the fishery um, at, at, in one trimester, that um, we work very closely with the other two states to pull together a, a, uh, a program that works for everyone, as much as you know, Dr. Pierce and the Commonwealth bends to the wishes of, of Maine and New Hampshire uh, for trimester two, we bend to the wishes of the Commonwealth for trimester three. It's a very collaborative spirit, and I think uh, if we get into voting on uh, on a very important fishery, both to the state of Maine and to all three states' lobster fisheries, I think we would be doing this, this, the, the industry and the resource a disservice. I, I, I prefer the collaborative approach. Thank you, Terry. Anybody else? Okay, are we ready to vote? Do we need a caucus? Not seeing any heads nodding, so. All in favor of the amendment, please raise your right hand. Three. All opposed? Null votes? Abstentions? Amendment fails uh, in the tie vote. So now we're on to the main motion. Uh, any more, just, uh, Doug? Um, I would like to make a, a amendment to the uh, default landing day scenario. Um, I agree with Terry that you know consensus has worked before. Although what our def 
previous default of, was is if we couldn't come to a consensus, there would be seven landing days. This is not a resource issue, but this is about trying to protect the resource. This is about trying to constrain the landings uh, so that there is um, um, so that there is a supply of bait throughout the trimester two area and um, the trimester two period, excuse me. And I think the default landing day sh scenario, if we can't come to a uh, uh, consensus, should be seven days or whatever, if it's in season, whatever the uh, um, uh, whatever the previous agreed to landings day. So I would uh, make a motion to change opt-in C1 to, I mean, C2 to C1. There's a second. Seeing none, motion fails. Any further discussion on the main motion? Okay, seeing none, uh, this is a final action, so this will be a roll call vote, Ashton. Maine? Yes. New Hampshire? Yes. Massachusetts? Yes. Rhode Island? Yes. Connecticut? Yes. New York? Yes. New Jersey? No. Motion passes uh, seven uh, six one. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> next item: review the scoping comments on the tiered weekly landing. Uh, Ashton. Okay, I'll just uh, start with just a brief overview. So there were scoping questions in draft addendum one. There was nine questions in there. I'm just kind of trying to gauge the public's interest in a tiered weekly landing limit system. So the um, it's whereby tiered, the vessels would be associated with a tier. The tiers are undetermined at this point. Everything is just very theoretical, just trying to gauge interest in it. Um, but if tiers were established, then you know vessels would be assigned to a tier, which would be associated with a different weekly landing limit um, for each tier. So this just is um, the initial question, which is the most important question because some actually public hearings refuse to go any further than this question. So the, it was, um, are you in favor of a tiered weekly landing limit system? As you can see in Maine, the majority were in favor. Um, in New Hampshire, they just found it very hard to comment um, comment on a topic where there, there was no details. There was, they basically said the devil is in the details and there are no details here, so we can't really um, give adequate comment on it. Although one person was opposed and one person was in favor, both were from Maine. Two other participants spoke generally about the, how, how the system could be tiered. In Massachusetts, uh, participants were not in favor except for one Maine fisherman. In New Jersey, no participants were in favor. They actually refused to answer any further questions about it. For the written comment, um, there was four um, individuals were in favor and six were opposed. And this is um, a quick summary uh, for those that were in favor. And this, this I pulled out these comments because they were basically reflect just the general comments um, for in favor and opposed. So if people were in favor, there was a preference for a three-tiered system, whereby tier one would include those category A vessels that had fished in the last 10 years. There was a preference for a three-tiered system based on permit category and harvester landing history. For those that were opposed, um, some of the comments included, it will not only limit or eliminate competition for a public resource that will cause price increases, the quota, and therefore the resource is not and will not be affected by the number of boats in the fishery. There's also a comment that said any future consideration of tiered access should, should really just go through the council and the council should be taking the, um, the initiation on this matter. So those, I didn't receive much more comment than that. I think that in general people just felt like it was difficult to kind of comment on something that was just a couple of questions that were asked in here. But overwhelmingly, if, if, uh, if one was not for Maine, that there was, um, there was opposition to a, a tiered system. Thank you, Ashton. Um, any questions or discussion? Okay, seeing none on, whoops, sorry, Terry. 
<clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just for the uh, inf the board's information, the the Maine Mar Marine Resource Committee considered a tiered license uh, a bill this past session, and many members of the committee attended the uh, public hearing we had on draft addendum one. Ultimately, the committee decided to hold this bill over until next year, and that's the current status of it. Uh, thank you for that update. So you'll keep us apprised next year. Thank you. Next agenda item is discussion of the 2016 spawning closure. Uh, the technical committee chair, Renee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, section members. Um, I'm here to go over the spawning area closure monitoring system that was piloted this past year. Um, and just a reminder of what was passed last year at the February meeting. So upon approval of Amendment 3, the Atlantic Herring section granted a one-year pilot of the new method known as the GSI 30 based forecasting system to be tested in the 2016 fishing season. The section can permanently implement the forecast system. Um, and just a very quick refresher on the forecast system for those in the room who didn't work with this or weren't familiar with it throughout the year. It's basically a relationship was made between the spawning condition of fish and day and we found that there was a linear relationship so what that allowed us to do is collect samples throughout the season and as spawning progressed it developed a really nice linear relationship that allowed us to predict the date at which those fish would go over a certain threshold and in a few moments I'm going to show you the results of that which was uh, put through to a website that we all monitored and I'll give background on that as well so that's the forecast system the section also has the option to revert back to the length-based closure system from prior years. The forecasting system is proactive. The length-based system is reactive. Uh, reminder what that looks like. That was based on two 100 fish samples taken within seven days. Defaults if there was inadequate sampling. And that was, uh, they basically were based on a percentage of gannadal stages, three through five, that had reached certain thresholds based on their length. So that was reactive. We waited until those fish hit us that reached that spawning threshold, and then we put in a closure. We had a wonderful partnership with ACCSP to implement this. We had a need to house the data uh, somewhere we all had access to it. So ACCSP had conveniently a biological module that was already in place that we were able to utilize and it allowed for formal coordination, the centralized database for all spawning samples. Uh, all states have access to it and it allowed us to help standardize our methods and results, which is extremely helpful when you're trying to coordinate three states, samplers and staff. This is just a snapshot of what that biological module looks like for anybody's curiosity. Basically, it just collects the information that we need to do the analysis um, with various coding. If there's any questions on that, feel free to ask me later. How is this implemented? The data housed by ACCSP are run through our scripts and are refreshed every two hours. So this website that we have that displays the results of this is the script is refreshed, refreshed every two hours and therefore what we see on that website is refreshed every two hours. So it's extremely real time. As data are put in there, we are able to see them and it can change the forecasted closure date based on real time samples that we're getting as soon as they can be entered into the system. The results are then displayed on that web page. We rely upon three samples, each containing at least 25 female herring in gannadal stages three through five to trigger a spawning closure. There were in two of the areas significantly more than that number of samples. Once the three samples are collected, closure dates are forecasted. So you'll see when I display what the web page looks like, we provide, there's no date that shows up as an image on this website until we have at least three samples. In both areas that were closed based on this system, we had more than three samples. 
Um, closure dates are set and notifications are made five days prior to the closure. Closures occur on default dates if three samples are unavailable. This is a timeline of what 2016 looked like. Eastern Maine was closed on the default dates because we were not able to get any sampling. So my understanding was there was minimal if no fishing occurring. That was August 28th through September 24th. Western Maine was closed via the forecasting system. That was closed on September 18th through October 15th. Mass New Hampshire was also closed based on the forecasting system. It was closed on October 2nd through October 29th. So this is an example of what the website looks like for us um, when those samples were run through the code and then displayed. So you can see there's a graph here of the GSI, so the spawning condition, and dates. Uh, this isn't very helpful because there's nothing on it because we did not have any samples. So you can see there's a closure um, threshold, and then in the red line, that's the default closure. It's a little bit more informative. This shows a little bit more what it looks like. So um, sampling in the Western Maine spawning area began on August 7th. Five samples totaling 216 female herring were collected to evaluate spawning condition. Based on the analysis of those samples, the Western Maine spawning area was closed from September 18th through October 15th. And you can see here each of those vertical lines of gray dots indicates a spawning sample. So those are each individual fish where you can see the GSI for those fish. And you can see over time there is clearly a linear relationship and then that allows us to use the actual fish that year to determine when it's going to reach that threshold. And you can see that the closure occurred well before the default because the fish we've seen have pretty broad interannual variability in the herring fishery, so they're different every year. So we want to make sure that we're closing and protecting the spawning fish when those fish are spawning that year, not next year. This is a, uh, what was displayed for Mass, New Hampshire. Sampling in Massachusetts, New Hampshire spawning area began on August 8th. Nine samples, totaling 654 female herring, were collected to evaluate spawning condition. Based on the analysis of the samples, the Massachusetts New Hampshire spawning area was closed from October 2nd through October 29th. So you can see here there's clearly a much larger number of samples. And this one closed just before the default date, so very close to what the default would have been. So evaluation, uh, when the TC looked at this, there are some things to take into consideration. 92% of the Area 1A suballocation was taken and the area was closed effective October 18th, prior to the opening of the spawning closure in Mass, New Hampshire. Due to the 1A closure, the ability to get samples after the spawning closure was limited. However, RSA samples were obtained that showed very few fish in spawning condition. So that is exactly what we expected to see and what we hoped to see. So samples after the closures indicated that the fish had spawned, meaning that we had done our job, so we protected spawning fish. And you can see there that 6% were in spawning condition, which is well below the 25% threshold. Uh, we also heard from a number of people uh, on the water, that's what they were seeing, that the fish seemed to be spawning when the samples said they were going to be spawning. So we considered that and not hearing of spawning fish hitting the dock like we had in previous years. Also, um, good corroboration to what we were doing. Next steps, so the TC is comfortable sharing the link with managers and public in 2017 to those graphs that I had shown based on the date and spawning condition, um, pending the inclusion of some caveats. The data are refreshed every two hours, so this is as real time as we can get, so it is constantly updating. The fewer the samples, the greater the changes in the forecasted dates will be as new samples are added. So that's extremely important. So if we have three samples, that's enough for us to forecast a date. However, as we get more samples and get closer to that date, 
that data is going to change and get refined. So the more samples there are, the closer that data is going to be. The further, or the fewer samples there are, the more variability there could be in that date. So that date is not fixed until five days prior to the closure. So that is something that's very, very important to understand, that that date will move around until five days prior, then it is locked in. That's the date. We'll notify five days prior. That's the date we set the closure. TC recommendation. The TC believes the forecast system was successfully tested and recommends the section permanently implement the GSI 30 based forecast system for the spawning closures in Area 1A. I'm happy to take any questions from section members at this time. Any questions for Renee? Terry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Not necessarily a question, but more of a comment. And, you know, while I strongly support the protecting of spawning fish and in, in, in the, the, in the new process and in, in using the additional sampling, um, the five day notice process last fall came close to impacting that goal. Um, we were, um, uh, with, with the five day notice that we got from the TC, the uh, uh, New Hampshire Mass area uh, would have not closed until the 2nd of October. Uh, which would have potentially allowed one full day of fishing on what really were spawned fish. There is a little bit of a, 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 a dance around that. I just, you know, I think that, you know, for the future, the section and particularly the section chair needs to, needs to be in close touch with the TC to prevent, you know, similar occasions. Because I'm sure every year is, as they are different, we want to ensure that goal. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Ch I mean, thank you, Terry. Um, so I'm not sure what action you are suggesting that we take. Um, thanks for the question. I'm not proposing an action. I'm just, you know, raising an issue that we came very close to, to not fulfilling our goal of protecting spawning fish. So uh, if we had strictly followed the TC's recommendation of five days, we would, with the exception of a last-minute scramble, have allowed for one day of fish fishing on, sp on spawning fish. So I think we just need to have that caveat that, um, you know, we need to keep our eyes on, uh, and it's a management discretion, the science, I mean, the TC is providing us with the most, with the best, with the best up updated data that they have, but we, we may, may need some management discretion. Thank you, Terry. <clears throat> Any other questions yet, yeah, David? Oh, I'll follow Terry's lead. It's not a question. I just wanted to uh, support what uh, Terry said regarding the possibility of our not having uh, complete protection because of a one day and maybe even a two day. So I've, I'll echo his suggestion, Mr. Chairman, as to the close communication so we don't end up with that situation uh, in, uh, in coming years. Uh, I, I would say, however, that uh, we do owe a debt of gratitude to the technical committee for the very hard work that they did to develop this particular approach and then to get it uh, in place and to make it work in the, this pre in, the, in 2016. It, it is a lot of work uh, and now they've very clearly demonstrated that it was uh, quite effective, that it was successful. And, uh, and with that said, uh, I'd like to make a motion, if it's appropriate, Mr. Chairman, regarding uh, the TC recommendation. Um. You can make a motion. I'm going, I'm, I want to let you know, I'm going to allow a little bit of public input because uh, there was cons concern, even though it was not uh, written in as part of this process for this to go to the AP. Um, that some members of the public wanted to comment on this, so um, I'll allow the motion in the second and then uh, discussion from the section, then I'm going to allow very limited uh, public input. So go ahead, David. Okay, I would uh, move that we permanently implement the GSI 30-based forecast system for spawning closures in Area 1A. Second. Dennis. Um, do we have any people who want to comment? Any members? Okay, so no section members. Um, I'll go to the public, uh, Glenn, and, and then uh, I believe Jeff wants to.
Yeah, Glenn Robbins, Fishing Pass Western Sea. Uh, these spawning closures are very important to me. We put these through in the 80s, back when Brandon was commissioner in Maine. But uh, out of the last five years, only last year did we hit it, and that was because they took some samples right to the end. I would recommend that you think about two to four days rather than five days. The previous four years, we didn't either close it first early enough or open it on time. When we opened it, the fish were still spawning. So you, you got to watch this. Uh, it happens too often. So out of five years, we, we blew it four years. So, uh, and I would recommend two to four days. There's not very many of us that, that you have to notify. You can notify us real easy, and we won't go fishing on them. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, Jeff, did you want to speak? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the section, uh, Jeff Kalin, Lunds Fisheries. Uh, I am the AP chair. I'm not speaking for the AP, but I came to the microphone because I did hear from uh, one AP member, um, Mary Beth Tooley, who's a council member from Maine, um, surprised that uh, you were going to be taking um, final action on the pilot program today. Um, I know myself, uh, I was too um, in the January, February uh, fisheries focus. Um, this was slated as review the pilot program. Um, the uh, March 7 email that I have on the preliminary agenda also said discuss. So uh, I think, you know, we were surprised um, that this final action is being taken today just with just one year of experience. You know, it may or may not be a good thing to do in the future, but the lack of um, uh, opportunity for the AP to consider this and raise some of the issues like Glenn just did about the notification period. What's the appropriate notification time period? You know, what's a projected impact on the fishery and so forth? You know, wasn't able to be discussed um, even though we had an April 10th AP call. So I think um, what uh, was suggested to me was that maybe you just run the pilot program another year, take a look at it a year from now when you have. 100% more information a second year. And uh, that's why I came to the table, Mr. Chairman. I will live either way. I, I have learned how to read a room in my political life, and I think um, whatever I have to say probably isn't going to dissuade the section from supporting the motion on the board. But I just wanted to raise that process issue. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, anybody else from the public? Not seeing anybody there. Um, we did have another a an AP member, as Jeff said, send an uh, email. A Ashton will read that. Okay, so this is a public comment from Mary Beth Tooley. It says, I'm writing to express my concern about the final action you have on the agenda for our herring spawn enclosures. While we have had an opportunity to provide public comment through hearings and an AP meeting on the addendum, there was no mention of this final action on the pilot program for spawning measures. Additionally, while there is a PowerPoint presentation on this topic, there is a no document that provides the details of the program. I would like to request the section to continue the pilot program in 2017 and seek input from the AP and Fishery prior to final action. Thank you, Ashton. And, and I also would just remind the section that uh, the AP uh, did take this issue up and uh, reported to the board. Uh, prior to the beginning of this uh, one-year pilot project. So we did hear from the AP concerning this issue. Um, any other, any other, Adam? So to that end, let, let me ask, what would be the harm in continuing this for a second year as the pilot? So how it was written um, in the motion whenever it was passed in February 2016 was there would be a one-year pilot program. Upon that, there would be a decision made prior to the 2017 fishing year. Any other questions or comment, Dennis? Yes, I'm in favor of the motion, obviously. But I think that going down the line, we always have the opportunity 
to change anything that we've implemented. So if we at a further date decide that this isn't correct or it needs any changes, modifications, etc., the board could take action at that time. Thank you, Dennis. <clears throat> Anybody else? Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I somewhat agree with Dennis. I find it's a lot harder to change direction than it is to delay a start. And uh, I like this system, but I don't see any, any problem with considering a second pilot year or a second test year before we make it permanent. I, it's, we're still going to use it this year if we did it that way. Adam. To that end, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to move to substitute to implement a second year of the pilot program. Is there a second? Steve Train, second. Discussion? Doug? Well, I'm opposed to this motion because I was supportive of imp implementing this in the first uh, with the original uh, amendment, but I agreed at that point because I did see some value in uh, having a trial year to see how it worked. Um, my uh, uh, read of the um, how it did work, including the report, uh, it is even better than what what uh, Terry had said. I didn't see. The, um, that much of a problem with the, the five-day notice and getting it out there whether uh, we were because we were so close to the default anyways uh, things worked out very well and it did a better job of predicting uh, than what our old system did by far I've been hearing for for years from fishermen that we were missing with our old system the spawning time people were uh, catching spawning fish before the closure would happen and sometimes it was the other way around and so I I think this is a good system I think they've done it it's a very rigorous system that was uh, developed by our technical committee and it's proven uh, that is uh, to be an effective tool and a much more effective tool than the other than our old system so I'm ready to move forward with it mr. chairman thank you Doug any other input Adam. Thank you. So just speaking in support of my motion, I, I have no doubt that it has had good effects in last year, but for the three samples, one of them we didn't have any samples to see what it would have indicated. Uh, I'd like to see a second year of it, and hopefully we'll have all three samples for a second year to confirm what we believe, uh, appreciate all the effort that's gone into it, but it just seems to make sense, especially here in some of the comments that we go through that second year. I'm a big fan of doing it right the first time, and I think this gives us the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Renee, would you like to uh, clarify? Sure, just a clarification that in Eastern Maine, uh, it is very common for us to have no samples or one sample. It's very, very challenging to get samples in eastern Maine. That closes on the default every year as a result. Terry? We're not covering my issue. You know, Adam, it's essentially some years you just play no fishing down there. Any other comments? Are we ready to vote? Do we need a caucus time? Seeing no heads nodding. We all, are we set to vote?
Okay, we are voting on <clears throat> move to substitute, implement second year of the pilot program for spawning closures in Area 1A. Motion by Mr. Nowalski, seconded by Mr. Train. <clears throat> All in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed, same. Null votes. One null. Abstentions. <clears throat> Motion fails. Three, two, one, one. Okay, we're back to the main motion. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Three, two, one, one. Doesn't that pass? I'm sorry, two, three, one. Sorry. Okay, main motion. Do you need that red, Dennis? All in favor of the main motion, please raise your right hand. Opposed? Null votes, abstentions, six zero zero passes. Now, review and populate uh, Lanny Caring Advisory Panel. Sorry, jumped on one. Consider approval of 2017 Fishery Management Plan Review and State Compliance, Ashton. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This will be very quick. So this is um, the FMP Review and State Compliance for the 2015 and 2016 Atlantic Herring Fishing Years. A quick review of uh, spawning stock biomass. So the 2015 stock assessment updated Update indicated Atlantic herring is not overfished and overfishing is not over not occurring. The next assessment will be next year, and that will um, be to inform the next specification package coming from the council. Just an overview of Atlantic herring commercial landings. I know I've gone into this in far more detail and draft addendum one, but just as a, um, an overview, the stockwide ACL for the 2016 through 2018 fishing years is. 104, 800 metric tons, or it's 230 million pounds. Um, the Area 1A sub ACL is 30,300 metric tons, which is um, adjusted for underages or overages in the prior fishing years. For the fishing effort in terms of landings, um, as you can see here, the purse stain and midwater trawl vessels account for, uh, on average, 99% of the Atlantic carrying landings in Area 1A. So depending on the season, the gear ratio will be different. In the trimester two, June through September, it's primarily purse stain um, vessels accounting for 99% of the landings, whereas in trimester three, it's, um, it's a little bit more weighted out where it's 55% of the landings are from midwater trawl vessels. Just an overview of management in, um, up to 2017. So as you can see, the variety of the fisheries management plan in 1993 um, all the way up to Amendment 3, which was passed last year. And now, in this year, it's no longer drafted in 1. It is now Addendum 1 that has modified the Days Out program moving forward. So the plan review team reviewed all the compliance reports from every state within the management unit from Maine down to New Jersey. Um, the focus was to make sure the states implemented Amendment 3 last year. The plan review team found that all states have regulations in place that meet or exceed um, the, f the fisheries management plan. There was one request for a de minimis status from New York, um, and the PRT found that they did meet the de minimis requirements, that the landings um, have averaged 0.6% you know, of the coastwide landings since 2014. So with that being said, the PRT recommends um, approving the fisheries management plan and approving um, New York's de minimis request. That's it. Thank you, Ashton. Any questions for Ashton? Um, is there a motion? Jim Gilmore. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move that we accept the FMP review and grant a minimum status for New York. Second. Terry Stockwell, is there any objection to the motion? Seeing none, it passes unanimously. Ashton, on repopulating the Atlantic Herring Advisory Panel. Whoops, sorry, Tina. 
Hi there, I'll be quick as well. Um, just letting you know that we have had uh, very poor attendance in the Atlantic Herring AP the past uh, couple of years. As you'll see from the memo that's in your briefing materials, we have five out of 12 active members. So we would ask you to look at those materials and look at the attendance records for those folks that um, we provided you some recommendations about who might be replaced. Of course, it's up to you whether you want to keep them on, but um, we, we really would like to have a fully functional AP at some point. Thank you. Thank you, Tina, and I uh, hope the states will work on this because uh, we, we definitely need a full advisory panel working on these issues. Thank you. Other business, Terry Stockwell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. With PK at the table today, I thought it would be helpful to, or, to have some uh, se section discussion on the RSA program in the spirit of co-management with the council, uh, particularly concerning the notification process uh, that the states receive from um, concerning when and where the uh, RSA fishing is going to occur. Uh, and speaking for the state of Maine, and I think as well for for New Hampshire, uh, we're, we're, we're not getting a lot of collaboration. And um, so when the council sits um, uh, again to do it, renew its annual specs and discusses the RSA program, um, I'm hoping that there will be some additional ASMC input into it as well. Um, would you suggest a letter coming from the commission? Thank you for your generous offer to write it. <laughs> Any objection? Uh, to the section sending a letter to the council or actually does that go to the policy board you yeah. know recommended uh, policy board a letter any objection to that seeing none we will do that anything else under other business David no, I just wanted to highlight uh, the use of the RSA fish uh, how we put it to good use um, port sampling monitoring a spawning condition move along strategies to avoid uh, bycatch of river herring and the like. We've had uh, some great cooperation with the sea herring fishing industry to um, accomplish all those very important objectives. So the, the research set aside has been of, been of great benefit to, uh, to assist all of us with the better management of the, of the fishery. Thank you, David. Anything else under other business? Seeing none, uh, any objection to adjourning? Seeing none, we're adjourned. We'll start lobster in about 10 minutes.